What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. Welcome back to America Trends, Larry Rifkin and John Kropsik. John, I did this one all by myself, pal. I didn't even have you there, my engineer, my colleague, my partner. I went down with my little mini digi recorder, and I went down to the campus of Yale University. Yeah, that's really neat. You got to go there live. And they said, are you a student? I said, a student? Of course. I'm a perpetual student. Until I die, I'm going to be a student. But I didn't matriculate at this Ivy League institution. And what an institution it is. And I ended up in this wonderful uh, building uh, that houses all these great political scientists, John. Ah, political scientists. I saw beakers <laughs> that were filled with red and blue. I saw all kinds of experiments being done. Now, honestly, I was really honored uh, to be able to talk to Ian Shapiro. He's the Sterling Professor of Political Science at Yale, and he, along with Francis McCall Rosenbluth, who is the Damon Wells Professor of Political Science, they wrote this book called Responsible Parties. Oh, okay. Well, we should be responsible parties, I suppose. Well, he's telling us that, unfortunately, the parties in America, the Democrats and the Republicans, have ceded so much control over their nominating process, the way that they are governed uh, to individuals, that the party has lost all ability uh, to have a coherent strategy long term. And the more we have democratized the process of nominations, for example, uh, the more difficult it has been to govern as a result. Well, plus they've they've locked out third parties. So, I mean, if you're if you're not in the club, you never get seen or, or you get very little, you know, seen. So. But the club has so little clout these days. I mean, we'll go back in this interview and folks, you're going to find this fascinating because the Democrats as late as 2016, after Bernie Sanders thought that the party and the super delegates had uh, really shorted him of the ability fairly to get the nomination, they democratized the process further, and now they've got 20 candidates, and they don't know how they're going to figure out who their nominee is going to be. Well, it sounds like both parties are really need to rebuild or redo it because uh, it's just crazy. The way we do elections is crazy. I mean, it's, I'm not looking forward to, to 2020 because of that. Well, as we look at it, the question that we're going to raise today is, what other things do we need to do as a democracy to make certain that the long tail, that parties are there to consider, the long view, the agenda that we can work our way through so that we get something done for the American public, as opposed to individual actors, because an individual actor is not a party. And they may not be around for a long period of time, and their goal may be just to get themselves elected. But we've got to think about governance. It's not about the latest, the hottest, the biggest fad. And Donald Trump is a good example of that. I mean, let's be honest about it. The Republican Party has changed a lot under Donald Trump. And after Donald Trump, they're going to have to figure out, are they the old Republican Party or the new, more populist Republican Party? But if there were some controls <laughs> that the party had in their nominating process, I imagine somebody else would have been the nominee for the Republicans in 2016. But they had 16 candidates, and he was able, basically, to hijack the Republican Party. And he did. The trouble is, we've moved too far to the edges on both sides. We've moved too far to the left and too far to the right, and we got nobody that's kind of bringing us back to the center, which, you know, there's good ideas on both sides of the coin, but nobody's there. Well, that was the function of the parties, because don't forget, in America, we only have two major parties. So it can't be like Italy or other parliamentary systems where you've got a party for every taste all across the spectrum. If you're going to have two large tent parties, they better be representative and they better come closer to the center to get anything done. Well, you and I could talk about this for days. We sure could. But 
not authoritatively, <laughs> Ian Shapiro can do that today All right. and will on America Trends. We welcome to America Trends podcast to Ian Shapiro, and he is a professor at Yale University, and he, along with Francis McCall Rosenbluth, have written a book called Responsible Parties, Saving Democracy from Itself. In that your argument in this book is that parties have a vital role in restoring our democracy to a healthy state, it might be best to do some poli-sci 101. Many may remember that parties or factions are not set in the Constitution, and George Washington warned against them. So how did they come about, and why is their functioning so important? Well, thanks for having me on. That is the right place to start, I think, because... It, it's true that not only Washington, but um, uh, Hamilton, uh, Jefferson, and uh, Madison all agreed that parties were a bad idea uh, when they were writing the Constitution. What's interesting is that they were writing the Constitution before engaging in politics in a large-scale democracy. Once they started to do that, they rapidly became convinced that they had been wrong when they were writing the Constitution, and indeed Madison and and uh, Jefferson formed the first political party largely to resist Hamilton's agenda of uh, the Federalist agenda. And so uh, actually they, they all changed their minds and, and quickly s learned that um, political parties are essential to the healthy functioning of a democracy. Give us examples of times in our history when you feel the party structure functions so well for the good of the republic that they really need to be credited in a way that I think today, by many, they are held in low contempt. Well, I think particularly in the, in the decades after World War II, where we had genuine competition among com uh, relatively strong parties. One of the problems in the U.S. is the parties are congenitally quite weak because of separation of powers and other things we'll talk about, I think, in a little while. But comparatively speaking, they were, were uh, strong in the post-war decades, in the 50s and the 60s, and we had competition among competing platforms. That's, that's what we think is most important. So uh, you know, we got the kind of political competition that produced the Civil Rights Act from the Democrats and eventually a reaction against some of that from the Republicans. But people knew what the party stood for and uh, they knew what they were voting for and could hold governments accountable when it was implemented or not. And that's the really the, the core of the matter, that if you have weak parties, it's very difficult to hold governments accountable because what happens in the world we live in today is that the parties have become so weak largely because of the increased importance of primaries. Of course, primaries have been around since the pro progressive era, but the, the importance of them has increased greatly because we're now in a world in which more than 90% of the seats in Congress are safe seats. And so the only election that matters is the primary. And then primaries have only been important in presidential elections since the 1970s, the big reforms of the 70s. And the dirty little secret about primaries is that there's very low turnout, and the turnout tends to be on the extremes of the parties. So you can get someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez elected in New York on an 11 percent turnout, or somebody like Jim Jordan in Ohio, favorite of the Tea Party and the and the Freedom Caucus on the Republican side, elected in a in a less than 16 percent turnout, and the people who turn out, it's not only that the turnout is low; they tends to be the people on the extremes of the parties. Those people then go to Washington, and. Either they, they compromise to come closer to what most Americans want and what the leadership has to do to pass legislation, in which case the people who elected them accuse them of, of selling out, being turncoats, you know, on the Republican side being rhinos, and on the Democratic side selling out to neoliberalism, whatever it is. Or they don't, in which case we get gridlock, what we're looking at now with a government shutdown. Same thing with Trump. He was 
elected, he was selected as the Republican candidate by less than 5% of the American electorate. And so he's a long way from the median voter in America. But of course, once selected, he's the only candidate. And if you have a weak candidate on the other side, as we did, then he, he's there. And of course, it's, it's the same dynamic as just playing out. He is now terrified of losing his base over this wall issue. And and they would turn on him. We saw this on the talk shows when, when he was considering it. But if he doesn't do that, we get dysfunctional politics. So we've greatly weakened our party since the 1960s by the increasing importance of primaries, by other things like majority-minority districts, which tend to produce, you know, they have an upside, which is we get better representation of minorities, particularly from the South in Congress. But the huge downside is we produce constituencies that, A, are safe, because the way you draw a majority-minority district is by putting all of the Democrats in, in the state into one or two districts, and that then re recreates this dynamic where the primaries are all that matter. And we create districts that don't look like America. And this is the this is the big problem. We get we get, you know, blue st blue cities in red states, we get redistricting done by state legislatures to create safe seats. We've had red state blue state sorting that create safe seats. But what we really need to do is to have representatives who are more like the typical American voter. And that's what we're not getting. This is why Congress is so much more polarized than the population. It's interesting. We're doing this interview in your office at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. I go back to the 1960s here in the state of Connecticut, John Bailey. He ruled the Democratic Party in Connecticut with an iron fist, and nothing got through the legislature without him, and then he became the national chairman. And yet, in many ways, I would argue when I was on radio that uh, sometimes we got better candidates coming out of those smoke-filled rooms in the back because there was an attempt to bring the party together around more centrist candidates. What has happened to the political center in America? So the political center has largely been vacated because of the dynamic that I've just described. We're not arguing for going back to the smoke-filled rooms and the party grandees, which indeed did produce a lot of corruption and political parties run largely like uh, mafias. Rather, what we're saying is that the congressional parties should have a much bigger say in the selection of candidates. So, for example, we don't think you could get rid of primaries. They're much too deeply ingrained now in people's expectations. But we could easily imagine a reform, I think, which said if, if turnout in the primary was less than 75 percent of the turnout in the previous general election, then it would be disregarded and the congressional party leadership would pick the candidate. Not grandees and not, you know, f uh, former presidents and, and party bosses. But think about what it, what is the incentive in front of the party leadership. They need to pick somebody who can both win in their district and support a national platform. So they're not going to go to people who are either extreme and won't support a national platform. When the congressional parties used to choose the presidential candidates, they would pick people that uh, they thought could could lead uh, a cohesive team. And that's what really is important when you think about what political parties do. They, they have to function like more like teams when everybody's pulling in the same direction. So if you think about, you know, just think about the analogy to football. Um, football teams give huge amounts of authority to the quarterback, to the coach, um, but they do it because they know they're all on the same team all trying to win. And if they don't win, the half-life of a quarterback or a coach is very short. You could never have had a situation where somebody like um, our current speaker now, again, Nancy Pelosi, could lead the Democrats to four successive defeats and stay there. But it's, it's, an, it's an example of how weak the parties are, because even when the members are unhappy with their leadership, the fact that they come from such disparate parts of the party means that they can't even coordinate to get rid of them. So if you look on the Republican side, um, the Freedom Caucus, who are the Tea Party people, 
I soon got very angry with John Boehner when he started to do the things you need to do to govern, but they couldn't actually get rid of him. He eventually left on his, of his own accord. The same thing happened with Paul Ryan. Uh, they really thought he had completely sold out on the Freedom Caucus, but they couldn't actually get rid of him. So you get leadership that's both protected and ineffective. They're protected because the parties are so weak that they can't coordinate on an alternative. And they're ineffective because they can't whip their own backbenches because their own backbenches know that if they agree with what the party leadership wants them to do, they're going to be they're going to go the way of Eric Cantor. They're going to get primaried and wiped out. You see this this very week. Why will uh, Mitch McConnell not bring a bill to the floor to simply to open the government? Uh, as as he for which he knows he could get you know probably 75 yes votes in the Senate. The answer is because he's facing a primary challenge in Kentucky. Um, so we have uh, we've we've made it impossible for our politicians to govern, and then we blame them for failing. Um, and people, you know, we constantly shoot the messenger. They're not evil people, by the way. They go into politics for the most part because they want to do the right thing for the country. But politicians respond to the incentives in front of them. And we have to change the incentives if we want the people to change. If we go back to the George McGovern, Donald Frazier reforms that catapulted George McGovern to the Democratic nomination for president, only to be followed by the worst defeat in modern Democratic large D politics, what should that have told us at that moment in time? What it should have told us is that we need not to uh, decentralize control of the political parties. Uh, it sounds good. It sounds more democratic, giving the people more control, giving the people more say. But you have to ask the question, which people? Um, because if it, if it is the case that you really get primaries and caucuses, caucuses are dominated even more um, by small coteries of intensely committed people on the extremes of the party, then you're not actually giving the people a greater say. You're giving um, you know, a small represent, unrepresentative sample of the people a, a greater say. And I think that the, the, the Democrats who started this with the McGovern-Fraser reforms, as, as you indicated, the Republicans then felt compelled to copy them. And so then it became almost a bidding war to show who, who was more popularly controlled. And then, you know, we, we're always fighting the last war. So the reaction against all of that was superdelegates. And, and superdelegates are a band-aid on a bad system. It would be much better to give more power to the congressional parties for the reasons I've said. But so superdelegates get, get introduced. And then, pe then the, 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 the more populist forces attack the superdelegates. And so what happened after that was we started disempowering the superdelegates. And the reason that the Republicans couldn't stop Trump is that their superdelegates were bound by the primary results on the first ballot. We didn't have that rule with the Democrats. The superdelegates were not bound, uh, but the Sanders campaign extracted as a condition for supporting Hillary's ticket that the, ref the Democrats would make the same reform, which they have now done. So this means next time around, if there's a, a Trump of the left, the Democrats wouldn't be able to stop such a candidate, even though, in fact, the superdelegates didn't stop Sanders. He, he didn't have enough even without the superdelegates. But so what, what, we've, what we discuss in our book, Responsible Parties Saving Democracy from Itself, is that this, this constant decentralizing control of political parties creates the illusion of more control when it, in fact, gives people less control. And so it, it creates the illusion of more accountability when it, in fact, produces less accountability. Because it, it stops parties doing what they need to do. So think about this. If you ask voters, should we get rid of any tax, even the estate tax, which is only paid on estates of above $20 million by less than half of 1% of Right. You, you, you can get 70% 70 70 of people to say yes. But if you ask them, should we get rid of the estate tax if it also means getting rid of prescription drug benefits for seniors, then they say no. So what's going on there? What's going on there is that 
in the first case, we're saying, do you want a tax cut? People say, sure. Anybody should have a tax cut. In the second case, we're saying, discount your preference for a tax cut by your preference for having prescription drug benefits for seniors. Then they come out somewhere else. That's what happens when parties bundle issues, right? They're forced to discount everything they propose by everything else they propose, and then come up with a program that they hope most voters will want. That's what a well-functioning party does. And so what we've done, another example of all of this decentralization, is, is moving towards more and more use of ballot initiatives and... Um, Referenda. And can I take you to California, where it seems that Californians really put everything that's controversial right on the ballot. So we see these swings where they go from a, a conservative Republican governor to a liberal governor. And maybe in part that's because they're not really making the decisions directly. They're putting them directly in the hands of the voters. So they're not taking risks and they're not really making hard choices. They're letting the public do it and they just keep bouncing back and forth. And it seems now that we on the national stage continue to bounce back and forth, going from a George Bush to a Barack Obama to a Donald Trump, and then giving the power of the House back to the Democrats because we're concerned and frustrated about what we did back in 2016. So it's got so much uh, uh, instability built into this process. So let's let's go back to California. They are they did lead the the way in many ways with ballot initiatives, but think about, you know, one of the most famous ballot initiatives in California, which was Proposition 13 in 1978, passed by a two-thirds majority, uh, said, yes, we're going to limit, we're going to limit property taxes to 1% of assessed value. Great, everybody gets a tax cut, wonderful. But of course, people are not required to discount that by their preferences for the schools, for local government services, for the, the things that are going to go south if you really limit property taxes. And so that's a classic example of why unbundling is bad for democracy and also bad for most people. So that's and that's why voters then get frustrated and flail around and, as you say, ba bounce back and forth electing different people who, who are l largely incapable of doing much uh, about the problem because we've got now this, this incredibly fragmented political competition issue by issue. Again, it sounds terrific. You know, voters are going to have their say on every single issue. But, it, you know, giving something like Proposition Proposition 13, it's, it's really what the right analogy is you're giving a child endless amounts of candy to eat without thinking about the stomach ache that's coming later and going to the doctor. And by the way, we're not alone. Look at Brexit, okay? Here you have an apparent paradox that is when you pull out the issue of leaving Europe and you run a referendum, you get a majority, admittedly a small majority, but 52% say, yes, let's leave Europe. We love England, English nationalism, wah, wah, wah. Ray, Ray, Ray. But why is it that both parliamentary parties are two-thirds in favor of Remain? The reason is that they know that if you bundle Brexit with all of the costs of leaving Europe, it's going to produce things that most British voters won't want. So that's why there's the apparent contradiction. It's not, you know, the parliamentary parties are, are elected by the same people who are voting in the Brexit <laughs> referendum. So it's, you know, it looks paradoxical, but when you understand what parties have to do, then you, you realize that neither party would want to be held accountable for a government that is going to pay all the costs once Brexit, if it goes forward, happens. And so it's, as I said, this uh, in our book we describe this process of democratizing control of parties all over the world. We have chapters about Britain and France and Germany, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and many of these same processes have gone on uh, all over the world. So they play themselves out, themselves out differently in our system because we have different structures and rules and our, our constitution produces that. But it's basically the same, what we argue, misguided impulse to think that 
more and more decentralized political parties is a good thing, and giving voters more say on political decisions, political the control of parties and the control of decision makers is a good thing, whereas in fact all it produces is people that can't govern. You seem to be swimming upstream because, as you said, the Democrats uh, decided because of the pressure from Bernie Sanders to take away the superdelegate status. It seems as if with social networks and the decentralization of communications today, where everybody's publishing their own view of the world, that this is going to get more and more difficult. And we're looking at a field, for example, in America for the Democrats in 2020 of a lot of individual actors, maybe 20 to 30. So how do you get this genie back in the bottle? It is very difficult. And we, you know, we have two views about that. I mean, our general view is, and the reason we wrote the book is we're trying to change the conversation and get people to see that actually that the, what they demand more and more and more of makes them feel increasingly alienated over time. It's, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's like bloodletting as a response to... Well, you called it that in the book. It's a kind of political bloodletting. It's, um, but the other thing is, what we we don't want pie in the sky solutions. We don't we don't propose any solutions that would require a constitutional amendment. For example, we propose things like dis discarding primary results when the turnout bel falls below a certain threshold, moving towards independent redistricting commi redistricting commissions, which, by the way, 20 states or so have done. It's just they don't give them the right criteria for redistricting. Uh, the criteria should be to create districts that are competitive across the parties, districts that look more or less like one another and more or less like America. Uh, flower petal districts around cities so that you have mixes of urban and rural voters, for example. And then for selecting president, again, presidential candidates, if you, again, if, if you have low turnout in primaries, let the congressional leaderships have a much bigger say in the selection of those candidates. doesn't have to be smoke-filled rooms. It can be all in plain view. This is not, it doesn't have to be duplicitous. But so what we're trying to do is, is yes, we're swimming upstream, uh, not to mix metaphors, but we think baby steps before big steps. And we, we try, we, in the different countries we look at, uh, we propose specific changes that we think are within the realm of what could become politically feasible. And then, you know, we would, we would press for other changes thereafter. What about ranked choice voting, which I know went on pretty successfully in Maine, uh, so that uh, people had a second choice and that choice kept everybody within a certain spectrum and a bit more in the middle, or things like uh, multi-member districts in small states like the one we're in in Connecticut? Uh, we think those are band-aids on a bad system because what it, it doesn't give you is, is competition of ideas between between two competing platforms, which is really, we think voters should get a genuine choice. And what tends to happen with that is you get, first of all, you tend to get celebrity candidates running with a lot of name recognition. You get people engaging in bidding wars to bring home the bacon. So you get a lot of pork barrel pol politics in Connecticut. It would mean, you know, people competing over how much money they were going to get brought to the Groton submarine base when you know, from a national point of view, Groton maybe should even be closed. So you'll get a lot of fragmented competition catering to very local interests. And that is not consistent with getting national platforms focusing on things that are good for the country as a whole. When you look at it, you want to give party leaders the ability, in certain cases, to punish independently-minded legislators of their own party, keeping everybody more in line. And yet it seems like the American spirit, we love the maverick. We love John McCain. We love somebody who steps away and uh, gives us a, a different voice. Is uh, this, uh, again, one of the difficulties in imposing more party discipline and thinking long term is that we like personality in America? Um, up to a point, but I, you know, I think taking the example of, Kemp, of, Ma of McCain, he was something of a maverick, but he, he was basically very committed to the party. And I think that, the, you know, Trump is a real maverick. Trump, I, I mean, I think M McCain largely, if you look at his, if you look at his um, roll call voting records, 
pretty standard issue. Repo he was a pretty disciplined Republican on almost everything. So I, I don't think anything we're proposing would exclude people like McCain from having a major voice in, in, a, in a right of center party. But they, they would make it more or less impossible for somebody like Trump uh, to get to be uh, the leader of, of the right of center party. I think you uh, looked at it, uh, what happened with Donald Trump as being a takeover, a blitzkrieg of a party. And uh, do you think that is going to be more likely uh, the the result of where we are today, if not, uh, you know, looking to the reforms that you're recommending? Is this likely where we're headed going forward and seeing more of this? If we don't strengthen the parties, yes, because it wasn't just Trump, by the way. This really begins in 2009 with the Tea Party in response to Obama's election. You get a hostile takeover of the Congressional Republican Party starting then, and then it happened at the presidential level in 2016. And parties are vulnerable to this. Again, uh, I mean, just look at the UK. Uh, they've gone to direct election of leaders in the Labour Party, which they didn't used to have. And so you get a situation where Jeremy Corbyn is elected by the, the membership of the Labour Party. They're sort of like primary voters. They tend to be well to the left of the typical Labour voter, never mind the typical British voter. So what happens? He gets to Westminster as leader, and most of the Labour Party in Parliament can't support his program and get re-elected. So you, they vote by 172 to 40 no confidence in him, and the membership re-elects him by 62 percent. Now imagine uh, Labour coming into government, which might happen because Theresa May has made her own mistakes. How would, how would Labour be able to govern when you'd have a prime minister pressing a national program which most members of his party couldn't support and get re-elected? So this has been a kind of hostile takeover of the Labour Party by the left-wing fringe of it. Again, it's it's something that's going to ha it's happening, it's happening all over the world. We're seeing it in Eastern Europe with these right-wing. They have open list PR, which again greatly open list proportional representation, which again greatly weakens parties for reasons I could explain if we had more time. But it it basically has the same effect, and so you can have these hostile takeovers from the far right. Or in France, where they, they have two rounds which keep small parties alive, and that's why somebody like Marianne Le Pen can do so well. Or in many of the, in, in Holland, in um, Austria, you've got all these extreme, these extreme groups now getting footholds in the legislature because of the fragmentation of their party systems. So we shouldn't think the grass is greener on the other side. Oh, what we need is proportional representation. What we need is is rank choice voting, which is sort of like proportional representation. All of that would just produce more fragmentation. We would get more parties, more candidates who are not committed to uh, any particular national agenda and um, it would make the problem worse. So the answer is to, to strengthen parties. Uh, everything else is a, a sideshow. If the Westminster system itself in the UK, and you like that system, is itself so much under attack and so fragmented or becoming much more so, how then will a system like ours, which really values state parties and local parties and then going to the national, and we're so uh, much a federalized system, uh, it, it would seem so much more difficult for us to get back to that point of strong parties if the public really doesn't understand the value of parties, which I don't think they really do, unfortunately. I think you're right that they don't understand the value of parties, and the principal reason is we've made it impossible for the parties to function, and the parties have become populated by people on their extremes, so people look at the parties and they want to throw up. The parties look terrible, but again, we, we have made it impossible for them to function, and then we're blaming them for not functioning. But if you don't understand how they work to begin with, you don't realize how much we have uh, denuded them. Yeah. So I think, I think that's right, and that's why we're trying to change the conversation. It's why we're pro proposing incremental changes that would make it better. 
On the federalism point, yes, it's a challenge, but nonetheless, the, the, the federal government is a, you know, it's a, it's a huge part of the game in the U.S. You know, if you just look at the amount of money that it spends, the amount of employment it's responsible for, the, the federal government is, is not a sideshow uh, by any stretch of the imagination in American politics, and it's not going to become one. And if we enable the federal government to be more effective, then I think voter hostility to its role in things like health care and um, um, education uh, would also dissipate and we might get better national solutions to some of the problems that voters most care about, which are not the things that the people at the extremes of these parties put on the table, like, you know, gun control and uh, transgender bathrooms. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of people are looking at the parties in that way, saying, you know, what does this have in common with my needs and my everyday concerns? If one would argue, and I think you probably have some critics who suggest that the trends like migration, economic inequality, digital technology, have more to do with decentralizing the political core or the middle than institutional arrangements, how would you convince them? that even in the midst of these very troubling issues, uh, this party structure and this long game that parties play really is advantageous. Well, that's a great example because it, think, think about what we've just been through in 2016. Both Sanders and Trump were proposing strongly protectionist agendas and even dragged Hillary Clinton to rejecting TPP and all of this. Now, if you look at uh, at those agendas. First of all, economists have known, and there's almost universal consensus for hundreds of years, that protectionism makes everybody worse off in the end. And secondly, the vast majority of American jobs are not going offshore anyway. They're going to technology, and that's going to be increasingly the case. But it's, it's such cheap populist politics to run against against foreigners, against offshoring jobs, against immigration. So it, you, what you do is you, you hand an issue to a populist who's just going to run on resentment rather than empowering parties to actually come up with programs that are going to address the problem. So nothing, nothing that Trump is proposing is going to bring back the jobs that he's right that have, they've been lost. And, you know, the, the, the level of unemployment looks low, yes, but the quality of jobs has gone down. The, the, you know, there's wage stagnation, there's downward mobility. People who used to work in factories and had promotions and status in their communities are now flipping burgers or, you know, so there's this anger and resentment. All of those things are not being addressed by the sorts of policies that populist politicians promise. And they can't be. So, you know, we need we need Congress to invest, you know, heavily in in education and perpetual adult re-education because we're entering a world in which a, somebody in their 20s is going to change jobs five or six or seven times in their lifetime. That they're going to need retraining. We need all kinds of things that only the federal government can really do. But we, we're not electing people who, could, who will do that, who will do the work to put together those sorts of programs to respond to these huge economic issues, which I agree with you, are, are going on behind. Yeah. Professor Ian Shapiro, he is a co-author of the book Responsible Parties, Saving Democracy from Itself. I want to thank you so much for being part of America Trends today. Thanks so much for having me on. Hey, Larry. Yeah. What's up, I got some exciting news for you. Well, let's hear it. We're part of the MHNR Network. And where can we find that? That's MHNRnetwork.com. I'm going there right now. All right. Hey.